contained information, but the standard data, data that we use exclusively is the National Weather Service. That's what we plan off of. So that's, that's how critical we think that data is. Not only can they give us data on hurricanes, but they can give us spot information if we have an incident in the parish, they can roll out a mobile unit, and they can actually give us spot forecast for that information. Extremely professional, always willing to help us, and, that, and again, exclusively, that's the data that we use to make predictions. Again, thank you guys for being here, and without any further ado, mm -hmm. I want to introduce Ken Brown uh, from the Slidell Office National Weather All right, thanks, Rick. Thank you. Well, thank you for the invitation. It's, it's great to be here. I'm Ken Graham. I'm the Chief Meteorologist with the Weather Service. And, and like uh, Rick was saying, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's hurricane season, and, and we do the briefings. So your tornado warnings, your flood warnings, your hurricane warnings, your general forecast. We have people right now at the office issuing the forecast for your airports. So if you fly out of the local airports, uh, the forecast in that cockpit is forecast from our guys back at the office. So all that's behind the scenes, fire weather forecasts, tsunamis, uh, the Weather Service even does space forecasts for the, the solar flares. There's all sorts of different things that the Weather Service does behind the scenes. But the most critical is, of course, the warnings. It's the hurricane information, it's the storm surge information, and it's the impact. And if you question any of the impact in Louisiana, and it's one thing that we were talking about ahead of time, I've mentioned it several times, and this is just to set the mood of how, how serious this stuff is. If Isaac was a Category 4, same speed, same size, but a Category 4, that water would have went through Gonzales to South Baton Rouge. That's your storm surge. Okay? So the vulnerability is serious. It's a serious topic, and that's why we need to talk about it today. So my, my goal today is to talk about some science, some social science, and then some products and some new things that we're doing that we're testing in our office. So one thing I want to talk about, our office is a test office. So we're located in, in Slidell. We cover Baton Rouge. We cover from Macomb through Baton Rouge, 60 miles out in the Gulf of Mexico, all the way to the Alabama line. Okay, so we have 22 parishes and we have eight Mississippi counties that we, we are responsible for, and we're a pilot project to test something new. It's called decision support. And, and Rick, you mentioned it, it's, it's providing the science and the data to make those big decisions. Okay, whether it's when the snow's gonna start so we don't have the school buses on the road, or it's when the impacts are gonna be uh, from a hurricane. We do a webinar, as Rick was saying, we do it every single week at Thursday, uh, Thursdays at 2 o'clock to make sure everybody's on board with the weekend weather. And you look at these briefings, that's the swerve. It's a significant weather emergency response vehicle. It's the only one in the country. It's the only emergency vehicle for weather, and it's actually deployed right now. We were asked by Homeland Security to go to West Virginia, believe it or not. It's the National Boy Scout Jamboree, 45,000 Boy Scouts, 150,000 people, nine counties. We were up there right now giving the briefings. And Saturday, I don't know if you saw the national news, the concert started early and ended early because of our forecast. And an hour after they evacuated the kids from that concert, 15,000 kids were put into shelter. The storms hit and lightning was actually hitting the concert. Okay, that's the seriousness of what we do. And that's the SWERVE. And we also call it the, you know, think about the acronym SWERVE. Meteorologists pull this thing. Let me tell you something, if you ever see that go down the highway, it'll swerve all over the place. Don't put a scientist behind a wheel of a 40-foot FEMA. But it is an old FEMA trailer that we got, and we converted it, so it was free. It's all donations, everything on that's uh, donated. So we're very proud to be able to do this for free. I brag about that all the time, how resourceful we were, because we got no money uh, to do that thing. This is what we've done behind the scenes with these briefings. This is actually an image of it. It could be at the, the Ascension uh, Parish. EOC, it could be a GOSEP, wherever you go, you're going to see the same briefing. Why is that important? The governor, okay, we also brief the president, the president, the governor, everybody gets the same information. So the governor will get the same briefing as the manager at Popeyes. Does that make sense? Everybody's on one page. It's very serious. Everybody has to be on one page or we'll have the wrong decisions made. This is the governor of Mississippi in the briefing, and you can see the different aspects of what we do, including the media interviews uh, during the heat of the battle. Something you might not know about us, we also were deployed in the Super Bowl. Why? It's a, it's a national event. It's a, it's a Homeland Security event. So behind the scenes, we're actually looking at uh, plume modeling to see if there's a terrorist attack, if it imp impacts a Superdome. Okay? This right here was my seat. I missed the entire game. These guys stood up the whole time. I didn't see a, one single play in that entire game. So if anybody thinks it's a boondoggle to go to the Super Bowl, it was not. I missed the whole game. So we were there doing our thing. I was actually in this command center when the lights went out. And you've probably already seen the news, it's gonna be a busy season, okay? Normally, June gets started off pretty quick, and then July gets quiet, and that's about to change. 
Okay, August and September get much busier. We are forecasting uh, a very busy season, and I'll show you that uh, it's not, it doesn't really matter if it's going to be busy or not busy, and I'll show you why here in a second. And it all depends on the, the global patterns, but here's what I want you to look at right here. This is called the ACE. This is the accumulated cyclone energy, and look at the values. We're predicting upper 100s, somewhere between 150 and 200 or so. Keep an eye on that value as I uh, remember that number as we go forward. Everything that we look at around the planet points to a busy season. Okay? We have a wetter than normal African monsoons kicking off all sorts of clouds, all sorts of storms coming off the African continent. The water is warm. There's not a lot of shear. Shear is everything. Shear is more important than the water temperature. Shear is a very important factor when it comes to these hurricanes. A typical El Nino, you have some winds this direction going from left of the screen to the right, tears the storms apart. And it's hard to get storms. We don't have that. So everything's pointing to a busy season. This is the ACE index I was talking about. These are your values over the years going back to 1950. The two that stick out here, 2004 and 2005. Busy seasons, remember? Very busy seasons. So where are we now? Just as busy, we're forecasting it to be just as high as some of those busier seasons. So everything is, is lining up to be busy. The other thing I want you to notice, notice how busy it was back here, 1950 to about 1970, and then a lull, and then busy again. We're in a period of time that it's just really busy. Hopefully, we'll come out of that at some point here, but right now we're in a busy time. And if you go back in time, you'll see these cycles going back in time. There are real big, interesting cycles that we don't fully understand <coughs> when it comes to these hurricane seasons. So we gotta be ready. The peak is coming. We're back, we're down in here. Notice how it ramps up. Typical get a few, nice lull, and we're about to ramp up. Okay, so our peak is coming. Here's what I want you to remember with this though. No matter if we're forecasting a busy season or not a busy season, it all depends on what? If we get hit, right? <coughs> if we don't get hit, I mean, you hate to say who cares, but, right? It all depends if we get hit. So look at this. This is 2010. We almost ran out of names. You can't see it, but that right there is the T storm. 2005, we ran out of names. Had to go to the Greek alphabet. I never thought I'd see that in my career. 20 years in, in the weather service. That's a T. But notice 2010. We were concerned about the oil spill. We had a little system come through, but look, they all turned. Okay, very active season, 2010. Almost ran out of, out of names. They all turned in the Atlantic. Okay, a couple down in here, but mostly they turned. 2005, what's the difference? It's the same thing, just moved over. Okay, so whether we get hit or not, all depends on the patterns where that high pressure is, the big Bermuda high, is it gonna turn this direction? Or if we go back, is it gonna do that? Okay, so that's the key to whether we're gonna get hit or not, and that has a lot to do with, so our forecast of the numbers is the number of storms, it is not a forecast of where they're gonna hit. Okay, so always remember that. So of course, 2005, we don't have to go over that. Uh, Katrina, Rita, and we did run out of names. How about 1965? Strong El Nino, not very busy, pretty inactive, not a lot of storms here. Had a couple of them turn in the Atlantic. What storm's this one? Yeah, that's Betsy, okay. So it's given away. 1992, the same thing. Not a lot of storms, very inactive. The very first one, very first one of the season, Andrew. Okay, so watch that. Don't be, um, we always tell the emergency managers, especially, we said, even if we come out and say, not as active as it normally would be, it really doesn't matter, okay? So we gotta be prepared no matter what. Last year, 2012, to recap last season, by the way, that's a T storm. So uh, all the way down the alphabet, even last year, very active. And of course, we had Sandy. You know, if you go back in history, we'll be talking about Sandy and Isaac, but look at all the storms. A different pattern wouldn't have been too good for us, correct? Some storms would have gotten engulfed, okay? Let's talk about Isaac, because there's a lot of stuff that, that we could learn from Isaac. Uh, rule of thumb, a lot of your stronger storms, when they get close to land, they either maintain or weaken a little bit. These are the scary ones. These are the ones that develop and, and strengthen as they come in. A lot of the ones that strengthen continue to strengthen all the way in. Isaac was the best developed, had the best eye when it made landfall. And you get the wind around the eye, and look at the rainfall. We had tornadoes in these bands. Lots of tornadoes from, from Isaac as well. So a very impressive look uh, towards the end, not really t till then. Look at these squalls. How long was Jackson County and some of these other areas in those squalls? Days, okay? Some of those areas got several feet 
of rainfall. The takeaway from this is your impacts on the ground have everything to do with where the storm is. It seems obvious. It kind of seems obvious, but it's more than that. Look what happened in Jackson County. Do you think they expected 24 inches of rain in some areas? Hard to predict where those bands are going to set up, okay? And they also got the tornadoes. Look what happens days after the storm. You still have these tornadic bands. Okay, so the impacts come early and they linger for a while. And the biggest takeaway from Isaac, bigger the storm, more the impacts. Slower the storm, more the impacts. Not about the category. Look at these values. Do you ever think a category one would produce a 12 foot storm surge? 12 foot storm surge. And actually the watermarks were about 14 because you got to add the tide and you got to add the waves on top of the 12. We predict the storm surge. You got to add the rest of it on top of that. Look at the storm surge values. Of course, we have the flooding and rescues. Here's the rainfall totals. History will remember it as the rainfall. You can actually look back. Our radar, the dual pole radar, actually predicts and, and uh, looks at how much rain fell with a storm. You can actually almost use your imagination and see where those bands were when you look back at the storm and look at the rainfall totals. 22 inches of Pascagoula, New Orleans, 20. You can see the rainfall totals. Okay, the storm was so slow, you got tons and tons of rain. If you're interested in the rivers, we have this website. Click on your favorite point and get the rivers. Look at the values. These were records. These were all the records in major uh, around the area. Okay, so if the water's high in the Gulf and the lake and you get tons of rainfall, that water can't drain, so it backs up. These are all the little teeny factors that, that we try to try to put in our briefings. Tornadoes, these weren't small ones either, by the way. Two EF1s and an EF2 tornado struck in Isaac, okay? And actually those bands, there was almost tornadoes after one after another in those bands. People were watching them, filming them. I was watching them on CNN. They were uh, cranking them out uh, quite a bit. So I want you to consider this for a second. I want to show you a list of quotes, and some people have seen them, and I think they're very, very important. These quotes are real quotes that I heard during Isaac. Many for, were from officials. There's a few maybe from the general public. Most of them were officials. These are quotes I heard during Isaac. And this is the social science part of the discussion here because we're getting pretty good with the physical science. We're getting good with where the hurricane's gonna go. What we're having trouble with is people understanding the information and doing the right thing with the information. And you'll see in a second. Here are the quotes I had heard during Isaac. The top one, this is just a category one hurricane. Everybody wants to insert the new name. They want to name them themselves, and the name is Justa. I don't know, I've never heard of the name Justa, <laughs> but Justa seems to be the, the new name for hurricanes. Everybody wants to add this Justa. Look, what's the problem with that? It's still a hurricane. And this quote was coming everywhere. I, I heard it from officials, I heard it from the public, I heard it on TV. Okay, we've been through Katrina, we've been through Betsy, we've been through these storms. Guess what people said but right before Katrina hit? I've already been through Camille. We survived Camille, and that was the worst. So we should be fine in Katrina. Some lived and some didn't after saying those quotes, okay? There's no such thing. It's not about the category. It has never flooded here before. Anybody here say that before? You've said that. People do, my neighbors say that. My neighbors say that all the time. We didn't flood in Katrina, we're good. I'm like, well, we didn't get hit by Katrina, okay? We didn't get, we didn't get a direct hit where I live. But that quote came from somebody that they built their house in the year 2000. So their entire historic record, their entire historic record for that latitude longitude is based on building that house in the year 2000. What's the problem? They had five foot of water in Hurricane Juan at that swamp where that house was built. True. Okay, the water went over the interstate, went into there, that area, Hurricane Juan, 1985, and it has flooded there before, but their record doesn't have that, okay? We went ahead and built slabs on three, three foot of land, but anyway, that's a whole separate conversation. So never flooded here before, be, be careful with that stuff. I've been through Katrina and Gustav, this is nothing. Don't compare storms, you'll get in trouble. You really will get in trouble. People do it all the time, and I'll show you some science coming up that actually drives this point home that you can't. They're, every one of them are different. Okay, and you'll see in a second that you can move a hurricane five miles and you get a totally different outcome on the ground. 
And I don't know, during Isaac, when I was on the Weather Channel, I, I, I got off the Weather Channel and I felt bad because I thought I was yelling, but I said, ignore the categories. It's about impact, impact. This is also on the news. I saw the news break into programming. That GFS thing says it won't come here. Whew. I never thought, I mean, I've been a meteorologist for about 23, 24 years. I never thought I would be giving presentations like this that had the acronyms for our models in it. I never did. Five years ago, we, even at the Weather Service, had to enter a password protected part of the website to see the models, the hurricane models. Think of that. That's only five years ago. Now it's on my phone. It's a good thing. However, here's the problem with that, and we need help. Depending on if you're a half, class half empty, you know who you are, class half full type of person, so positive or negative, depending on your personality style, you're picking the solution that best fits your personality. I saw it a little bit in Gustav, and I, I sure saw it in Isaac. And how many years have we been saying, please pay attention to the cone and not the skinny lines, right? We've actually gone back. It set us back a little bit because everybody has these lines, and that's fine. But now we've got to figure out ways to interpret that information, okay? So be careful. Don't get caught with that. We're looking at all those models. This is the same surge forecast as Gustav, and I didn't flood then. That came from an area that flooded in Isaac. That came from an area that didn't get hit by Gustav. You see the problem? Just because it hits somewhere in the southeast, people have gone through it. Right? They've gone through it. So if you have places that didn't take a lot of wind, I mean, you, you know, Baton Rouge, I mean, look, you all, look what you all went through in Gustav, right? So it's all these other factors as well that, that you may or may not have had in the past. My app has most of those lines way is to here. I like the one that says Clipper. Again, people were choosing that solution. Clipper's not a model. There's a couple lines in there that aren't even models. They're climatological. We use them internally. We've used them internal for decades, but now they're out. Okay? These are just climatological. If history was to take over and was the perfect storm, this is where it would go. It has nothing to do with the weather pattern. Okay? And it's never correct, ever. We have another one that says if it keeps going straight, this is where it would go. All it's doing is extrapolating. Okay? The storm's going this way, the forecast is here, this line goes this way as if it kept going straight, and people are like, ooh, I like that one, we're in good shape over here. See what's happening? Got to be careful. We are going to evacuate for all Category 1 hurricanes from now on. I heard that a lot after Isaac in this state. What's the matter with that? Not every one of them are going to be like Isaac. See the problem with that? So what's the problem here? So if we evacuate people for the next Category 1 that has different characteristics, it's smaller and fast, where we probably don't have to evacuate, you do that two or three times, Right? And Ma and Pa evacuate to Nashville with everything they own and spend $2,000 every time they do that and come back and nothing happened. Are they going to do it the third time when Isaac comes again? They're not going to go. Right? That's why we can't base it on the categories. Oh, great. I have a GIS map. Finally, something accurate. Y'all don't say that, do you? Okay. This, this happens a lot. People are looking for a pretty picture. They're really looking for a pretty picture. Have to watch the data that goes into it. Okay, watch for that data, it's better. Here's one, this was huge in Sandy in the Northeast. We just had our 100 year storm last year. Right? So it can't happen again, well, that's not the way it works. And another little quote that's not on here, there was information that in Hurricane Sandy on Long Island, New York, that basically said, and, it, and you know, it's, it's people trying to do the right thing, that said Sandy is gonna be twice as bad as Irene. Right? Sounds pretty innocent, doesn't it? Twice as bad. Trying to get people ready. That's going to be horrible. Twice as bad as Irene. The direct interpretation of people on Long Island, after hearing that information, was like, well, you know, Irene, I got six inches of water downstairs. I'll have about a foot. I'm in pretty good shape. All they did was say twice as bad. Six inches to a foot. They got eight foot of water. Okay, so these little subtle social science things. Again, the forecast was, forecast was pretty good for, we were dead on in Isaac. We weren't that bad in Sandy either. We're getting pretty good with that part of it. How do you get the information out to get people to, to 
totally understand what that impact is. That's tricky business, really tricky business. Okay, I did that forever. Um, preconceived notions, you all have them. Isaac didn't fit, here's the deal. Saffir Simpson scale, the categories, is based on wind only, that's it. It's just wind, it has nothing to do with the storm surge, it has nothing to do with the impacts, it is wind only, it is a scale of wind, that's it. It ignores wind duration, why is that a big deal? Big deal for your parish. The longer that storm push, pushes water on Lake Pontchartrain, the more water you get, right? Simple as that. The slower the storm, the longer the wind. The slower the storm, the more rain. The slower the storm, the power lines come down and the trees come down. The slower the storm, more power outages. And a wider area. Small storm, you get a lot of power outages too, but at least it's a path. This is a large area. So all the impacts are different. Storm surge is higher. Heavy rain, river flooding, all that's ignored in, with, with the categories, okay? So there's no such thing as a category one. And let me tell you something. Isaac was only a hurricane for about nine or 10 hours, it's arguable, okay? Isaac was only a hurricane for about nine hours. Subtract those one or two observations and Isaac would have been a tropical storm producing that big of an impact. You talk about a nightmare then trying to get information out, just a tropical storm would have been the tough issue. So I want to share something behind the scenes that we do. This is one of the slides from our PowerPoint that we brief the governor, that we brief emergency managers. This is our slosh model that predicts storm surge. It did a great job, but notice, what do you see on this slide? What did, what did we have to do behind the scenes to come up with the right solution for Isaac? What do you see on here that's a little unusual? It's in the title. Cat 2. What's it doing there? I thought we were dealing with a 1, barely a 1 at that. Isaac was so far out of the box that we had to pick the solution that best fit the storm surge. It's interesting. In fact, we took it so serious, I was so worried about it, the very next package, we just eliminated that category altogether. We left it blank, and I took a lot of internal criticism for that, but it didn't matter, because we had to make sure that people weren't saying, why are they showing a two? They must be planning for one up. I don't know what those guys are doing over there, but the reality is we're trying to show the best the best picture for the, for the situation, okay? A couple things to notice. By the way, I won't get into it too much. What we do is we pick lots of different paths. This is your storm surge value. Look at the water in Lake Pontchartrain, Moripaw. That's storm surge up the Mississippi River. We had eight foot of storm surge go right up the river, all the way to Red River Landing. Think of that for a second. That's the power of these things, okay? We're low flow, so that water went right up the Mississippi River. So this gives us a good depiction of what kind of flooding that we're, we're going to get. You're not gonna change your behavior, a 30% chance of rain. Will you change your behavior if it's 30% chance of your house going underwater? Probably, okay? So we've been nervous about, nervous about doing the probabilistic forecast for a long time, but we're not now, because if we share what that impact is afterwards, I think people get it. I think people understand that and let them make their own decisions, okay? And you can actually change that to the different values. If you ever get a chance, Google like, a, a, like an elevation map, a topographic map, look, look how where Ascension Parish is. If you look at it, the vulnerability of the parish here, you have Lake Pontchartrain. So your vulnerabilities are any storms over here. This pocket, notice these, this is the, the greatest areas of the yellow and the red. Why is that? No, this is out in the Gulf. This is out in the Gulf and also getting into the land. The water's trapped. You know, between Plaquemines Parish here, the lake, and you got the Mississippi Gulf Coast, it's no different than your favorite fishing hole where the water gets piled up in there with, a, with an east wind, okay? The water gets trapped. So the vulnerability of Ascension Parish is the water getting into Lake Pontchartrain, going through Moripaw, and look at this blue area here, and it spreads out. That's a huge vulnerability. And if you look at it, it's just falling in the low ground, which includes Gonzales, includes a lot of, we actually did a, for Lamar Dixon at one time, I forgot, must have been after Gustav or something, there's a lot of low ground. So this value here, by the way, is five to seven feet, okay, of potential water, subtracting elevation, okay? And this was with Isaac, that was the forecast. Subtract elevation, you still have a few feet of water. So there's a lot of water that comes through. So the longer the storm sits there, the more water gets pushed into Pontchartrain, the water drives it into ascension and keeps driving it further inland and further inland. More water piles up. It's going to find every nook and cranny wind-driven. Think of the physics. So the wind is driving that. Who cares about gravity? Because you've got wind driving that water. What happens when the winds subside? 
several things. The water's trapped in some places. You've got to pump out. That's one. The other part of it is now it's going to find gravity to get back to the lake because that's where it wants to drain, and that's going to be a slow process. It's going to take time. So the water gets piled up in here, and it can't drain because the lake doesn't come down. By the way, see that opening right there at the Wrigley's? All that water has to drain through that small <coughs> opening. It backs up. So just like your bathtub, that water piles up on one end, right? The wind goes away. It's got to come here. It piles up, stops, sloshes. It does. It comes back. You actually have water not only slow, but you have multiple peaks of when that storm surge comes in. Days after, Ascension, St. James, a lot of the parishes here have to deal with the storm surge. Some of the peak storm surge that you're going to see could be three days, four days after the storm. Anybody you know, remember Isaac? It was pretty similar to that. Way after. Does that fit what your mind should happen? Your mind says storm surge, like a tsunami. That's what people equate a storm surge. People really relate to the tsunami part of it. Comes in and it goes away. That's not how it works. Okay, it all depends on the wind. If you go back to Gustav, it took the storm being well north up into Arkansas when we finally had that wind shift out of the south and that piled the water up again, remember? Okay, days after, three, four days afterwards, we were dealing with that. Okay, this is a category two. We're ignoring the categories, but it's a typical category two. If you go to a three and a four, this whole area right in here is pretty low. It's very vulnerable, okay? So it's a big threat. So you don't think of yourselves being too much in the storm surge threat, but without a doubt, okay? Especially in your small, there's little bayous, and if you live by one of those, then it becomes even a, a, a bigger issue. Any questions on that? Okay, so that's why we're gonna have this where you can zoom in and be able to, to peek at it. And I'll show some future products that we're gonna have in the future. Katrina was a category three about a 28-foot storm surge. Waves and tides added another 10 foot on the Mississippi Gulf Coast, okay? Had about 35 feet storm surge on the Mississippi Gulf Coast. Ike, a two. Just a category two going to Texas. We had more storm surge in Louisiana than we did with a direct hit with Gustav. It's not intuitive, it doesn't make sense, but it's real, it's about the size. Why? Ike was huge. Ike was a massive, massive storm. Okay, Ike was big. Storm surge got to Galveston Island. This is also one that scares me, and I think Rick and I talked about this. It has to do with the, the H hour and, and the timing of these storms. Ike was so low, large that the storm surge reached Galveston Island about 18 to 20 hours before the storm. So what were people doing on the ground? I've got another 15, 20 hours before I have to be out of here. <clears throat> right, and they were swimming out. With a storm with that much notice, they were still swimming out of there and getting rescued, okay? So the, the impacts are everything on these storms. Look at Sandy and Isaac, just ones, quote. <laughs> Look at the storm surge was significant. Wait a minute now, what's this? Category four, Charlie. Why was the storm surge so low? And we're gonna look at that. Lake Pontchartrain levels, this is Mandeville. We forecasted eight foot, we got about 8.3 Laplace. This impacts you. Here's proof, this is the actual readings. Look how long, first of all, landfall. There were two landfalls. This is a second landfall when it finally made permanent landfall. Had it took some time, about 24 hours afterwards when you got your peak water. Look how long it takes for it to come down. The gauge going in and out periodically because it's a lot of water. It takes a long time to get the water out of here. So be prepared for that. It may take some time to get back after these storms. This is Charlie. This is proof it has everything to do with the size, not the category. This is Charlie, okay? 25 mile radius of maximum winds is what we use as an average to calculate our storm surge, to calculate the data. Charlie was about approximately six teeny storm. Category four, but only six miles, the radius of max winds, not a lot of storm surge. Here's your average. This is Katrina. Okay, Katrina had a large area, about 40 miles radius of maximum winds. You ready for this? Isaac was 50. That's why we got the storm surge that we did. Okay, Katrina. Charlie, six, average 25. Katrina, 40. Isaac, 50 miles radius of maximum winds. That's why we had the impact that we did. Okay, has everything to do with speed and size. 
Here's proof. This is the storm surge model. This is Charlie. This is using the average. These values here, purple is 18 foot of water. Red, 16 foot of water. This is actual. This is at six. All I did was shrink down the size of the storm. That's it. And it's a radical difference on the ground, what you get. Now we're only getting what these, these blue values here, about six foot, even inland, you know, pushing some water in there, but nothing close to the devastation than if it was 25 miles. Okay, size, little teeny thing. Shape of the coastline, water gets trapped, water gets trapped, the entire Gulf of Mexico is a trap for the water. Okay, and I got, you'll like this one. So water can funnel in any one of these areas, but it also gets funneled in just as a result of the shape of the coastline. Here's another example. Identical storms, two identical storms, both category threes, both moving at 10 miles an hour, one moving northwest, one moving northeast. The result, storm surge on the ground, completely different, just based on the direction the storm's moving. Then this kind of hit the quotes, can't compare storms, you can't. You cannot compare storms. So right here, we're talking a good, uh, about, that's 19 foot of water, terrible situation in here, and a lot less with it moving a different direction. So it all has to do with, uh, we've already talked about the size, now we've talked about the angle of attack. How good are we? This is 1990, this is 2012. We have cut the error in the 24 hour forecast on where that storm is going by 58%. In that same period of time, we've cut the 72-hour forecast error by 67%. In 2012, we are down to about under 50 miles, so about 48 miles of error in either direction. We consider that a high-five forecast. We don't high-five because these are serious. But that is a meteorological high-five forecast, right? 48 miles, that's not bad. 24 hours out, if we could hit something within 40, 50 miles, that's not a bad forecast. A bubble in the wind, right? That's what we're trying to forecast. Okay, so we're not that bad. 72 hours out, we're down to about a, what is that, about 105, 110 miles, not that bad. So we're getting good at where they're gonna go. Here's intensity. How are we doing with that? Some improvement in the longer term. Look at the 24 hour. Those in the back probably see it getting a little worse. Okay, I'm a glass half, uh, I'm definitely always a half full person, so I'm, I'd look at that as even, though, even though it's getting a little worse, but anyway. Look at that right there. Okay, we're not making any, much improvement at all when it comes to the intensity forecast. That's, that's still giving us a fit, okay? So for us to say it's gonna come in at a, a category one or a category two, that's just one mile an hour difference separating those two categories. That's the other reason we can't compare using ca categories. One mile an hour difference gets it into a different category, and that has a whole different mindset, but really it was only one mile an hour. Okay, so we're struggling with this one. I wanna show you this. We talked about angle of attack. This is a Gustav type storm. This is the track. This is the resulting storm surge. Water gets trapped in the pocket. Water gets shoved in Lake Pontchartrain and Moripaw. Look how it goes beyond Moripaw. Back to the question about Ascension Parish. Okay, Ascension Parish, St. James Parish, St. John. Look how the water just spills through. That's all flat, you all know it, right? If you're driving on I-55 or drive any of the roads around here, you know that's all flat. That's the natural place for that water to go. Higher sea level, go back in ancient times, that was probably all water. So you look at this, look how the water spills over with this storm. So this is what you're planning on. So, six hours later, we have a new forecast. Okay? It's this one. I only moved this. How far did I move that storm, anybody? I don't know, 30 miles or so, something like that, maybe 30 miles. Not much difference. How's the solution changed? Pretty drastic. Okay, so if this situation, and I live, let's just point, I live in a camp right here, we're gonna ride it out because this thing's gonna miss us, and it moves, now I'm in trouble, just like that. Okay, just that little teeny movement, now you have the water spread out more because you've taken it out of the pocket, you've had more come in this direction, now let's do something else. You live right there, Hancock County, okay? This one's not very good, but you think you're gonna be okay. This one, you're pretty happy. 
Might even start up the start up the party going, right? You're in pretty good shape here, feeling pretty good. Within the error of our forecast, still a high five forecast, now it moves the other direction. What happened? Now you got taken out. And these could be within a six hour period, right? You've seen how our forecast changes. It can do this within a six hour period because it changes, it moves different directions. It's still a bubble in the wind, okay? Now I put 17 foot of water into that Hancock County, okay? So everything to do with that, size, distance, and let's look at storm surge, let's look at the science. Rotation around a hurricane, you have the wind on the surface. When you have the wind on the surface, it actually blows the water, right, towards the storm motion of the storm. It piles up, gets heavy, it falls, sinks, okay, moves around. It also cools, and you get some cooling there too, so it starts to circulate. Underneath the water, you have a circulation. That's what's happening in the storm surge. Out, just like a tsunami. A tsunami in the over, open ocean, little ripple. If you're in a boat, you wouldn't even know it. It's a little teeny ripple. Once you get close to land, that's when things change. When you get close to land, same thing. Rotation, wind, you start to get close to the land. Assuming we have the barrier islands, then you get into the actual land itself. You cut off that downward component of the water. You see how I've done that? You cut that off, can't go backward because you have land, so everything goes in one direction, and guess what? It piles up. That's your storm surge. In the simplest <laughs> terms possible, that's your storm surge, okay? And it continues to, continues to pile up. And like I said, in Hurricane Ike, this could have been 18 hours before the storm even gets here. That's why some of this H hour scares me somewhat because we base H hour on what? Wind. We base H hour in this state on wind, okay? You gotta watch it because sometimes you can get 20 hours ahead of time, you could already be getting the storm surge, okay? So we have to really watch those type of things in the heat of the battle and of course we're, we're uh, taken out, okay? So that's kind of how the process, process works. I told you the Gulf of Mexico is a, is a, it's a trap for the water. This is some research um, one of our guys are doing. This is uh, Tim Erickson's research at our office. This is interesting. You ready for this? Water. This is water level in the Gulf of Mexico. Because in the summertime, your Bermuda High gives us, what are the winds? Southeast wind. We frequently get such a southeast wind piling up the Gulf of Mexico. The water levels in the Gulf of Mexico peak out. These are the months. This is in the year. It peaks out August and September. Isn't that interesting? Lovely, isn't it? Okay, it couldn't be the other way around. So the water in the Gulf of Mexico, we go back in time. He's, he's starting to, he wants to go back two, three hundred years and do the research. That water is the highest in the Gulf of Mexico every August and September, which is pretty interesting. Okay, by how much? Not a lot, right? You say zero, I don't know, whatever. It looks like an inch, inch and a half over the whole Gulf of Mexico. That's a lot of water. Does that make sense? It's a lot of water. Okay, interesting research. He put different points and it all leads to the same thing, okay? We need to be careful with this. We've been through, of course, Katrina. We've been through a lot of, a lot of storms. The storm surge is the big thing. We're gonna have to watch all the impacts. For you all, remember Gustav, the wind, you get the rain, you get the surge. Impacts haven't happened outside the cone. Folks, the, the cone that we use is not a cone of impact. It is a cone of error. It's a statistical model that we run to come up with that cone. It is not the cone of impact. Here's an example. There's impacts outside the cone. That's why we have the warnings up, and you'll see that over and over on these examples. Gustav, every one of them is so different with what they do. Gustav's kind of interesting, just a little historical fact. We think we recorded the highest wind ever recorded in history from Hurricane Gustav on Cuba. It got over 200 miles an hour, and then the mast broke and the building collapsed. Isn't that interesting? But the data was saved. That's what was headed towards us in Gustav and a little bit of different movement just added up how that could have been a, a different impact, impact on the ground. Let's look at Gustav real quick, because every storm is different. Compare that to Isaac. Compare, you're not supposed to compare storms, but let's compare it a little bit. Hurricanes don't just form and stay uniform. Gustav is going through an eye wall replacement at the last minute. So one eye wall goes away and a new eye wall takes over. That's typical. You can Google it and go look it up and, and study that. It's pretty fascinating. So it's breathing. It's changing. Right at landfall, it was changing to a new, a new eye wall, and it got expanded. 
larger storm, more storm surge. Right when it expanded, it threw a lot more storm surge over to the Mississippi Gulf Coast. Little teeny changes, big difference on the ground, okay? Once it got the new eye, it tightened up right over. <laughs> you all, all right? You all and, and, and Baton Rouge, that's when it tightened up again and caused all the damage, okay? Those are the subtle, subtle um, impacts on the ground that can happen from these, these systems. Uh, Isaac, barely a one, large size. We've already uh, been through that. In history, heavy rain events. The big takeaway here, notice depression, storm, storm, storm. Now we have a hurricane, okay? What's interesting about this, it doesn't just take a hurricane. Remember Allison, it doesn't have to be that. So again, listen to the, listen to the impacts. That's the cone, 2003. Because we're getting better, this is the cone now. It is a statistical model. If you connect those dots, 33% of the time, your storm will be left of the track. 33% of the time, it'll be right of the track. What's left? 33% of the time, it won't even be in the cone at all. <laughs> Think of that. It is pure statistics, okay? It is not impacts. The impacts occur well outside. Where? Ike. We had impacts in Louisiana, didn't we? Big impacts. Remember the storm surge and the wind? Look, not in the cone. Not in the cone at all. I just circled it there. This one, same thing. This is Ike. These are all things on our website that you can get. Wherever you work, if you need these things, the probabilities, it's all there. All this stuff, you look at the probabilities. So not in the cone, but look at this, interesting. Tropical storm force, force winds, we got a 30 to maybe up to 50% probability of getting those type of winds. That's pretty high. Ike, again, the impacts, look at the probabilities. So look at all these products in the heat of the battle. You want as long as a plan as you want, and that's good, but just be prepared to do this. Lead time is great, however, you may not always have it. This is Audrey, 1957. Category four, big storm, big impact. Do you know it was a tropical depression, just called it a depression, 72 hours before landfall? By the way, a depression doesn't have a name. So it's not even named. 72 hours before category four. Tropical storm finally gets a name 48 hours before landfall. Not because it was a bad forecast, because it didn't exist yet. Be careful with the, those type of things. Camille, in your minds, you're thinking Camille must have been a long-term storm, must have traveled across the Atlantic. No. Camille, this is the path of Camille. Okay, landfall is a category five. Tropical storm got its name 80 hours before landfall. We've got to be prepared to go pretty quick. Isaac taught us that too, right? Isaac kind of snuck up. What was tough with Isaac? That weekend before. It's like Isaac was really gearing things up. I mean, it was a weekend. Weekends are tough, right, for everybody. Everybody's doing something, doing different things. So that even makes another challenge to get this information out, looking at the, the day of the week. Bill, okay, landfall. 60 mile an hour winds, pretty significant. Depression, 30 hours before landfall. Cindy, same thing, you get the point. Okay, depression, 48 hours, you may not always get the lead time. These are storms. We define rapid intensification as the increase in the intensity of 30 knots in less than 24 hours. There's lots of them. Okay, so they can change quick on us, so you gotta pay attention to the latest forecast. Here's something that, um, I find interesting, just tells you about the long-term problem that we have. When I, t when I speak to um, high school kids and, and, and college kids, especially the grade schoolers, I always try to show them things like that because I think their generation has some big major decisions to make. Okay, what am I talking about? I don't, I don't think it's gonna come for my generation. I think we're well into what we're doing in life. The next generation has some big decisions to make. This right here is sea level rise. This isn't a model, this is measurement. These are the measurements that we've made in NOAA, okay? Some of the highest, if you take subsidence plus sea level rise, some of the highest in the world is occurring here, okay? So measuring, we are measuring three to four feet sea level rise per century. Now you see why when I tell these, uh, the, the young people about 
they got some big decisions to make. That's a lot. That's going to make a southeast wind rough, isn't it? So if you look at that and take future storms, future hurricanes, it's going to compound the problem with time. Okay? And again, it's not some model, because it, and, it, and it doesn't matter what anybody's opinion is on, on the climate of the Earth. This is purely looking at the data that we have. So as a result, it's going to be more important than ever that our agency and others get into the impact business. Do you agree? We have to get into the impact on the ground. Okay? And here's one of the changes we're making for this year. In the past, you go to our website, and you can say, here's a probability of, it could be the, here's your probability, 30 to 50 percent chance of development, greater than 50 percent chance of development. We put the X on the screen, and then we leave it at that. We let you guess where it was going to go. We took a lot of criticism for that, which we should have. So as a result, we're actually painting a picture of where that storm's going to go. So we don't have to worry about these, right? It's going this way. We have to worry about this one. So that's going to be on the website starting here, hopefully in about three or four weeks. We'll have that on the website. You're going to have impact graphics on our website, lots of them, for all the different impacts. You're going to be able to see those on the website. Here's an example. This is during Isaac. This is the wind probability. We have, an, we have a high in the categories trying to get uh, everyone to understand exactly what that means. So it's a high probability of that. That's the storm surge one I've already showed. Extreme. 2015, we will have a storm surge warning. Our office is already testing this. You will have a storm surge warning. So even if the storm's going somewhere else and you don't have a hurricane warning, we're hoping that a hurricane warning will get people's attention. But even on top of that, if we don't have it, the storm surge warning will. Does that make sense? Because we're so vulnerable to the storm surge. So starting in 2015, we'll have a storm surge warning, brand new. And starting next season, 2014, we're going to have inundation graphics. We're extremely sensitive, as I showed you, with the error, right, with the storm surge. So what we're going to do, this one right here was done that way, we're going to run a thousand models. Take one model, run a thousand different scenarios, big or smaller, left to right, we're going to do everything we can to that hurricane, and as a result, that's what we're going to come up with. That's a safe way to play it, because if we run it this six hours, here you go, you're going to be okay, you lose electricity and have no way to get information, the next one is closer to you six hours later and you're in trouble, right? If we're irresponsible with this graphic, people can die. Online, our website, you can also slant Baton Rouge, either one doesn't matter. Follow us on Twitter. If you don't think Twitter's, when I, when, it was only five years ago when somebody was following me, I got all paranoid. I thought I was actually being followed. I didn't know, I really didn't know much about Twitter. Twitter's changing the world. You know, we have the weather radio, we have all these type of things. Let me tell you, we get more information. I never thought, I, again, I never thought I'd make this statement. We get more information a hundredfold times over on Twitter than we even do our, 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 the community calling in. Twitter, there's tons of stuff. We get pictures instantaneously. We get tons of information on Twitter. Okay, it's really changed everything. So follow us on Twitter. Like us on Facebook. We try to put some stuff on, on Facebook as well. It helps. And I want to let you know behind the scenes, again, I, we invented this in Birmingham back uh, about 2002. It's chat. So behind the scenes, we're chatting with the TV stations. We're chatting with the emergency managers. We're all together on this information, which is critically important to me. So lots of questions answered. We have all sorts of information that people can use on the chat and graphics. So behind the scenes, we're all talking together. Mobile alerting. How many of you are getting warnings on your phone and you don't even know where it came from? Right? Some of you are. It's new. OK, that's CMAS. That's a partnership between FEMA and the Weather Service. Call if you need something. We have two people around the clock. If you wake up at 2 in the morning bothered by a cloud or bothered by a storm, worried about the rain in the morning, call. Call. They'll appreciate it. They're trying to stay awake as it is <laughs> at 2 in the morning. It's not easy. So call them. We're very, we're very proud of the fact that we're probably, I don't think there's too many agencies, especially uh, us feds, that you can call 24 hours and talk to a human. You'll get my voice at first, but then if you press number four, then you'll, you'll get one of the guys and gals over at the office. Thank you.